Now, you know, I go where angels fear to tread sometimes. Amen. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They'd try to tear us out of the Bible. Yeah. Along with the speaking and, and other languages and this and that. New tongues. Verse 19, so after the Lord had spoken to them, he was, was received up to heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Yeah. That is a fact. Amen. How many believes it? Amen. Sure, sure we do. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall... Recover. So, where is the prayer for the sick? I want to go to Second Chronicles now, chapter 16, and verse 12 and 13. Second Chronicles, I'll give you time to find that even on the iPad it's difficult. It's not there. Yeah, it is. 12 and 13, Second Chronicles. Now, this guy had a physical problem, and we all do from time to time, do we not? Sad to say, because of the fall, and sometimes it isn't our fault, but other times it is. You know, too many donuts, this and that, too much stress, no sleep, now I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> and Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, till his disease was exceedingly great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Everybody go, uh-oh. Uh-oh. And verse 13, Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and forty year of his reign. Now, our country has devolved to the place where any little sniffle with the children, we've got to take them to the doctor. When I was growing up, go play. Hmm? A lot of it's because the government pays for the doctor bill. But I want to ask you a question. Do we believe the Bible when it says they'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? Yes. But you see, there's a sequence of events here we need to understand how this operates. But in the end, God will make the final decision. Someone said, Brother Randy, would you pray for the cancer? My cancer. Your cancer? Pray for my lumbago. Some of thought Winnebago. <laughs> Would you pray for my, ar my arthritis? Yeah. No, I won't. But I'll pray to God for you about your arthritis that you claim by your own words. Right. Right. We've got to be careful about what we're claiming now because Satan can take advantage of this and pour it on big time and we're all guilty sooner or later. See, now, this guy, I don't know what caused his diseased feet, but again, he sought not the Lord first. Right. I want to get this across now, everybody, because God is not going to change his protocol for any of us. And sad to say, we're all guilty by not following the Lord's instructions. Yeah. Yes, Amen. And we need to repent about this and, and change our thinking about how God wants us to uh, operate in the confines of His Word. Outside the Word, we make a mess. So this guy died. Not that God wouldn't heal him, but he did not go to the Lord first. He ran off to the arm of the flesh first, and that was a big, big mistake. Everybody say, ouch. ouch. Now, I'm not saying it's not, it's not wrong to go to the arm of the flesh and get some medicine. I'm not against medicine. You know that. 
God created herbs for medicine. Even in a future millennium and future eternity, uh, there's healings uh, for the nations coming from the fruit of the trees and so forth and so on. And so God is a healing God, but the way he does it sometimes. Now a miracle is bam, now. But healing is a process. And I explain it this way. Let's say we've got a problem, okay? So when we come in contact with the covenant that we're in and it's activated, for that problem, the infirmity, disease, affliction simply turns around and goes the other way. Now, you can carry it if you want to, but it isn't God's will for any of us to carry anything that's detrimental to our walk with him and our victory. And so this guy died because he ignored the Lord first. Now, what if he would have went to the Lord first? Now, it's guesswork, but I would presume things would have been better. Well, we've got to get this operation. I told the veterans, you're not getting my gallbladder. No. Run me through two hours of test. This guy goes, well, Mr. Davis, there's nothing wrong with your gallbladder. I said, I could have told you that. Told you I wasn't going to get it. I still have it today. Praise the Lord. And they're still not going to get it. But if I was to get a gallbladder issue, there's a protocol that we need to follow to see what the Lord might do for us. And it's wrong to go get a sonogram on your gallbladder if you haven't sought the Lord first. That's what I'm saying. This is all in the Bible, so... I need to go with what the Lord gave me today. So now we're in the New Covenant. Thank God. That guy was in the Old Testament times. It was tough back then. But it can be tough on us today if we don't follow God's pattern for victory. Now, in Acts chapter 10, 38, very plain, this is what Jesus did. We all know this verse of Scripture. Hallelujah. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, there's the Trinity, who went about doing good and healing all that repressed the devil, for God was with him. Right. Amen. Smith Wigglesworth, the great apostle of faith, taught that all sickness is from the devil. Amen. All of it. Amen. From a headache, right on down. Right on up. And he pr- approached it that way. Now, what kind of guy is this that goes down to the morgue and gets a corpse? I've read it many times. This guy was twice dead. He stands him up. Now, he's a corpse. He, he, he's a stiff. Stands him up in the wall and hits him in the stomach and says, Live. I command you to live. And the guy fell down on the floor. Well, he was dead. Of course, everybody's outside listening to the commotion in the mortuary. Stands him up again. He said, I command you to live, and hit him in the stomach, and he fell on the floor again. Nothing happened. Third time, he said, I'm not telling you again. Live, hit him in the stomach, and the guy came back to life and walked out. Now, what kind of deal is that? Do we have enough nerve to go do that? I got to hear from God. (laughs) I got to hear. But if He says, we go. Now, of course, there's always been those great men of faith, and uh, we got a ways to go. But a mustard seed will grow if we'll just let the word sprout up in us. Amen. We can reach it. Praise God. So Jesus walked this way. Now, he healed everybody that came to him in faith. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 25, Mark chapter 5, and verse 25 and 26, so I want us to get a hold of this now. The faith preachers preach on this all the time. 
A certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. You all know the account, right? Very familiar. And suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all her money, all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now, does that sound like today sometimes? And the insurance doesn't pay for everything, and we got a big uh, bill. Bill collectors knocking on the door. I'm saying that she didn't have the revelation that we have in the Bible today, but she was looking to the physicians or the doctors, and she didn't get any better. Spent all of her money. That's as bad as some lawyers I can think about. We'll come back, take, a, take an aspirin, and come back and call me next week, you know. Now, if doctors could heal everybody, they'd be out of business. If chiropractors could fix your back, they'd be broke. If lawyers could get you out of your mess, they wouldn't have a job. So let's get it down to where we really are. We are here. We need to go to the great physician, top priority, number one. What she did, thank God, she did. They tried to stop her. She pressed through the crowd, and she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Now, that garment had a border around the bottom. Jesus wore the best clothes. He wasn't poor. And in the Old Testament, the, the priests would be anointed, run down their beard and down their uh, attire, and then it would settle, coagulate around the bottom of the border. So what she was saying is that if I can just touch the anointing that Jesus has, just the hem of his garment, because that's where the, the oil would, would gather. So there's more here than, than what's, what we're told, but we can accept the fact that she knew that Jesus was the Son of God and anointed. Right. And then she touched him, and Jesus said, well, well, who touched me? Now, he didn't heal her. He didn't. Right. He, he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, well, they're, they're thronging you. And they're all touching you. He said, yes, but somebody touched me in faith. Right. See, because right. I felt power leave me. Now, man alive. But she wouldn't give up. But the point is, she had to get down to where there's nothing left. Sad to say, that's where we have to get sometimes, to get serious about our walk with God. And how bad does it have to get for some people? It doesn't have to be that way, but people are stubborn, you see. Even Israel was a rebellious house. Well, she went about the wrong procedure, but it worked in the end. She didn't know any difference, so we can accept that, can't we? She got her healing, and she got her miracle. Then in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5, the next chapter over there, please. Now, I'm going to lay something on you now that's been brought to my attention by the Spirit many years ago. And I didn't catch it for many, many years. He could there do no mighty work, say that he laid hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Where's the prayer of faith? I mean, where's the prayer for the sick people? Right. Jesus always spoke in faith, but where's the actual literal prayer for the sick person? And I'm saying he laid his hands on a few, a few sick folk and healed them, and he marveled because they're unbelief. Now, something that was brought to my attention, because the Bible says in many places he healed them all. But some places he couldn't heal them all. Do you know why? Well, because the unbelief of the people that were bringing the sick folk to him. It wasn't the sick person. It was the people that was transporting the sick person didn't have any faith. And so he couldn't heal them because they wouldn't bring the sick person to him. Sad situation. The unbelieving transporters didn't believe it. But then another account is Mark chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. Now these people we're going to talk about and look about in the scripture had the right procedure. 
Amen. Mark chapter 2. Mark's a good little book. In a strict way, we will turn back there. In verse 1, And again he entered to Capernaum after some days, and was noticed that he was in the house. Who's in the house? And straightway, that word's always in Mark's gospel, many were gathered together in so much there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word to them. Number one was the word. And they came to him bringing one sick of the palsy which was born of four. Here you got these guys carrying this, per- this person with palsy. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when he had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. So if I understand it correctly, this is Peter's house, the apostle Peter. And they tore off his roof to get the sick guy down to Jesus. On a board, a cot with ropes. Can you get a hold of that? Jesus said, what do you think you're doing? Tearing down that roof. Shame on you. No, he didn't have one negative word to say because they were operating in faith. They were operating in faith. Now the old guy on the, on the cart, the cot, he has nothing to lose, right? And I got to believe he was expect, expecting and believing too. Amen. Anyway, now verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, Amen. Amen. Boy, it's great to have somebody have faith for you, but what about four that have faith for you? That's more than two or three. And so he said to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee. So there is God forgiven sins. Amen. Now we've got to understand something tonight. That there's no difference with God in the forgiveness of sins or the healing of the body. No difference. None. Zilch. It's easier for us to accept the fact that God forgives sins that's invisible and yet not. But when it comes to the physical, it's more difficult for us to accept the fact there's no difference. He taketh away. Amen. The first time I had a split and headache, no, it was a fever. I'll take it back. I was working in the wood shop. Had a fever. When a fever comes and hits you out of nowhere, it's from the devil. Every time. Now, there are other times it's a virus, but, you know, when it just hits you out of nowhere and you're down, it's from the devil every single time without exception. And I couldn't get it prayed off. So my mom came over. She was a tongue talker. She come down to the house. And her and Tribby laid hands. <laughs> Did they pray for my fever? No. <laughs> and as soon as they got to praying, of course they anointed it with oil first. First. We'll get to it in a minute. And immediately... That fever left as fast as it hit me. And I laid there really in shock. I just couldn't understand it. The Lord said to me, are you going to get up and confess your healing or not? (laughs) So what I do? I got up and confessed my healing, went back to work, never did come back. Just like that, in a moment of time, a split second, it was gone, just like that. God can do that. I've experienced several of those times. Amen. Amen. Then other times, no. I don't have all the answers, but I thank God for the times that it manifests in the healing or a miracle. Amen. Amen. Now, <clears throat> they got him to Christ. Now, Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. Hallelujah. Well, what are you going to get to? Well, we're getting there. Hallelujah. Luke 10, verse 30. Now, now get a hold of this account. Jesus answered in verse 30, There was a certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves and was stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. That sounds like the human race. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Uh-oh. And likewise, the Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan. Now that Samaritan was Jesus. As he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So Jesus is explaining about himself here, and using this story to explain it. Okay. So when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound him up his wounds and poured in oil and wine. Everybody say, oil and wine. Now this is important. Oil represents the Holy Ghost. You all know that. But wine represents an anesthetic, 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 analgesic, uh, some type of medicine. So we say, well now, that wine was merely grape juice. It wasn't fermented. No, wait a minute. Wait, you can't prove either way, so just be quiet. Sometimes it's this way. Sometimes it's that way. But the fact is, when you pour wine that's got alcohol in it onto a wound, guess what? Exactly. Are you getting it? So the wine represents the medical industry and medicine that's proper for your ailment. But don't forget to seek the Holy Ghost first. Are we going to get crossways with God? Are you getting it? One. So, they bound his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to the inn, took care of him. That's what Jesus is doing for us. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, that's two days' wages, and gave them to the host, that's the Holy Spirit, and said to him, Take care of him. Turn to your neighbor and say, the Holy Spirit's taking care of you. Praise God. Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay you. When I come again, after two days, when I come again, I will take care of business. Now you go to the book of Peter, and one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day in the eyes of the Lord. So we could safely say that two days' wages was 2,000 years, and the good Samaritan is going to come back at the end of 2,000 years, and folks, the clock is ticking on the wall. Praise God. Yes, we were wounded by the devil, but thank God for the Holy Ghost, and thank God for medicine. Now, hallelujah. An antiseptic, medicine, is not wrong. It is not wrong to take medicine. Don't go out here and say the preachers say you're sinning if you're taking medicine. Because I've never said that. Look, if I, something happens and I need some blood in the hospital, give it to me if it's the proper, you know, old positive, old negative, whatever it is, I don't know. I don't care if you get red, yellow, black, or white. Blood's the same. Amen. And by the way, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I will. When you ladies uh, stop your, uh, your cycle, you need to give blood every now and then. It'll help your physical anatomy. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, 1 Timothy 5.23, one of my... Uh, Scott Brumley, bless his heart, he's gone to be with the Lord now. But this is one of his favorite verses of Scripture that he used to use uh, in the wrong way. 1 Timothy 5.23. Drink no longer water. Yeah, I'll see my own hollow oil. But use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities and every time I quoted that, he said, yes, and I mean often infirmities. <laughs> wow. We laugh about it, but you know. This is talking about medicinal purposes. Yes. That's right. 
not gold. What, 20%? I don't know. So, it doesn't mean to quit drinking water. Can we be logical here, please? But you see, apparently Timothy didn't have the health of the great apostle Paul, and so Paul said, look, you got upset stomach for medicinal purposes, take a little wine. But don't abuse. See, this is a problem with the Americans, is that we can't control this. And then it starts controlling you, and now you've got to get rid of it, or you're going to be sinning, and no drunkard's going to get into the kingdom of God. But on the other hand, it isn't wrong. I tell you what, Brother Martin, next time I, it, it, God forbid, but if I was to get a terrible fever and the flu, I want you to make me a hot toddy, will you? Do you know how to do that? I bet you do. <laughs> I know the formula how to make a hot toddy. I've got to tell this joke. This is a true story. You're going to hear it again, because I like to tell it. Billy Joe Gentry, I'll just call him name. God bless you, Billy Joe. I know you don't listen, because I'm Pentecostal. But it's okay. Still love you. He got down with the flu. Okay, here's a preacher. Got down with the flu. This is four years ago. We didn't know anything but doctor and grandma's way. You know, Bengay, you know, vaporizer, and a hot toddy. My dad and I, we go in there. Billy Joe, man, he's down on the, he's down on the bed. Man, he's, he's on the sofa. He's sick. Oh, man. Oh. And we went and got us, uh, grandma called it liquor. But it was, I don't know what it was. Jim Bean, Jack Daniels, Wild Turkey, one of those. It was whiskey. And we're there, Dad and I were at the sink, and we're going to make him a hot toddy. I, you know, we get the hot water and the, I shouldn't tell this. <laughs> Nutmeg, uh, honey, uh, and then a shot of whiskey. And we give it to him and said, drink it. He drank it a little bit later. Well, do you feel any better? He said, no. We'll go back and make another one. And this time, it's a double. My dad, I can see him now. He's been gone 25 years. He laughed. Ah. Well, killer care. Bless the Lord. Dad just laughed. Took the bill of made him drink every bit of it. We left. So Sunday come to church. Time to go to church. And, uh, I said, uh, I said, sir, uh, did that hot toddy help you any? He said, well, I don't know if it helped me, but I slept like a baby. <laughs> Fact is, he passed out. That's what happened. <laughs> now, let's go overboard. Don't do that now. Because it was wrong, but I didn't know any better. <laughs> yes, a little wine for your stomach's sake. Yes, amen. Well... The VA told me, now, if you will drink a little of this, a little of that every day, it'll take your cholesterol down. Now, I shouldn't be telling this stuff, but that's what they told me. I said, well, how much? <coughs> See? Because I come from a long line of drinkers. There's no such thing as, as one eight-ounce glass of wine. <laughs> no! He said, you can only drink uh, one beer or one four ounce of wine or eight ounce of wine a day and that's it. Any more won't help you any. But it will take your cholesterol down if you do it. I said, is that all? No, I haven't done it, but I could and you can't stop me. <laughs> now if I come here next Sunday morning, yeah, I'll see my hello. I love God. I watch those drunks crying their beer talking about God. Love God more than some church folk. Makes, it makes you wonder, who's going to make it? Well, the Lord knows, unless he chooses not to know. Can I go on? Well, so the thought is for medicine. Medicine. Amen. Don't abuse it. Yeah. My dad would say, I've got to cut this flame out of my throat. Look, look, look. Any excuse to do, right? right? But that's not what the Bible is talking about. It, that's, that would be wrong, don't you think? Now, I'm going to get to the last scripture tonight in James chapter 4. 
And lay this on us now. See how many can say yea or nay. Amen. So healing and forgiveness cannot be separated. Amen. If God's forgiven us, then God will heal us in the same, through the same atoning work of Christ. Amen. And I know we accept things we shouldn't accept. But what if we begin to deny things that's hitting us? So I refuse that. What if? James 5, 14. Amen. Is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, if anyone's sick in this church, it's your responsibility to call for the elders. It isn't my responsibility to go to you and say, do you want prayer? You look like you're sick. No, that's not the way this thing works. Right. Number one, today, number Jesus is in heaven, okay? But he put authority in the church. Those with the spiritual oversight. Amen. And so number one, if we're sick, you are to call for the elders of the church. And to me, it's wrong and an insult to Jesus to go through the arm of the flesh and evade the process. Oh, that's a better preaching than what amens I'm getting. We need to repent. Well, what if? Well, what if? So let's look at it now. Let them pray over him. It doesn't say necessarily pray for the sick person, but to pray over the sick person, like a prayer, like a prayer umbrella. There's something about the sick person submitting. Everybody says submitting. Now we men are pretty bad about that, bless God. I'll just tough it out. Well, go ahead and tough it out. Oh, I can really peel your hides tonight. But I'm guilty of myself, so God's grace is sufficient, right, for everybody? No. The truth is, we need to call for elders of the church. First. And because the oil is put in the wound before the wine, the elders are to anoint the sick person before they ever start praying. Amen. Ah. And thirdly, where's the prayer for the sick? It's the prayer of faith. That's what matters. You already know you're sick. God knows you're sick. The people that are praying know you're sick. We're not praying for your sickness. We're interceding to God for help for you. But if you don't submit to the spiritual oversight of the church, you're wrong. And God's not happy. Am I doing all right tonight? Okay. We'll put it back up now. So they anoint him or her with oil. Now the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Everybody knows this. All right. In the name of the Lord. Then they begin the next verse. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith. Yes. What are we praying for the sick person? It's a prayer of faith yes. to God. Now, show me where Jesus prayed for the sick. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying I've overlooked some scriptures that's probably not there because he just spoke the word or he laid hands. You know, already done his praying. See, most of us, we'll get prayed up before we pray for somebody. Well, we're, we're praying the prayer of faith, not necessarily praying for the individual. The individual is submitting to the authority of Christ that's in the church. 
And then we just simply obey and do what God said to do. I don't have to feel a thing. Anoint with the oil. Then the prayer of faith. But if you don't call for the elders to anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith over you, you're wrong. Because this is God's protocol. This is God's format. Now, unbelief stops the manifestation of God because He will not override your will. It's like this morning. One didn't want to come forward to be delivered. Well, I'll never ask again. This time, He'll have to come to the elders for the prayer of faith. I don't chase people. Amen. If we knew how serious this was, you'd be hounding us. Would you please pray the prayer of faith over me? I don't feel good. I got this wrong, that wrong. Anoint me, please. Because we're ignorant. We think we don't need God. Wrong. That guy with diseased feet, if he could come back, he'd change things. Amen. See, you can you condemn yourself by the things you allow. Blame somebody else. That's carnality, and you need to repent. Well, I'm not getting any votes tonight. The fifteenth verse: The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Amen. And if he has committed sins implying that sins cause the sickness. Now, not always, because sometimes it's just the fall. We're living in a fallen condition still. Nobody's fault. God's got us covered, though. So, whether the person sinned or not, it's immaterial. The fact is, no matter which way it was or is, Uh, the prayer of faith shall save the sick, the Lord shall raise them up, and if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So here we have forgiveness of sins, if the person was in, living in sin, and also healing at the same time. That's the deal. Amen. Now, the prayer of faith, all right, let me go through the events here now, I'll quit. The order of events, the sick calls. Why is it some of you think that you bother me if you, you call? Why is it you go to everybody else in the church instead of God's format? That's because you have pride. You evade God's ministers and you're on your own. Well, I don't believe that. Well, then do what you want. But I'm just saying there's a way that God operates. And the second thing, anoint with oil. All right? The third thing, Holy Ghost power will be present. And we may not perceive that. You don't have to have goosebumps to know that God's present, everybody. If we're doing God's order of events here, He will be present. Now, the third thing, pray the prayer of faith to repeat over the sick person. It's like a prayer covering. It's like an umbrella. It's like... We're convinced of this. The office of the pastor has a certain protective element for the sheep. And I'm a sheep too. But the office, you see, has authority. In fact, there's no greater authority in the church than the local pastor. That's it, period. Even when an apostle comes in, they must submit to the authority of the pastor. Prophets, same, it's all the same. 
If I go somewhere, I submit, they're the one in charge, I'm glad. They're responsible. In Africa, many years ago, we had a little squabble back in 2004 in the village. And somebody comes and says, uh, uh, there's a problem. And they come to me, and this is what I say. Go tell the pastor, oh, that felt good. Go tell, remember that? Go tell the pastor, that felt really good. Because I wasn't the pastor. Amen. Well, now here's the kicker. The next thing is medicine. Now, you, your spiritual pride, that's sin. We've done what God said to do. His protocol. Are you getting this? Now, the next thing, if necessary, is medicine. Medicine. Yeah. And Mary Hart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Yeah. What the Word of God says. So God doesn't condemn taking medicine if it's the right kind of medicine. Right. Right. Okay? And Luke was a physician. God does not condemn the medical profession for practicing medicine, but it's still a practice. You need to do your homework. But when you find something that will help you, please take it. Don't be stubborn and arrogant. Well, I've prayed, bless God, and now I'm standing in faith. Well, there's nothing wrong with medicine. The oil and the wine, number two. If you get it switched, you got a problem. It isn't going to work like it should. Well now, preacher, what if it doesn't work? I knew you'd ask that. Well, here's my answer. The results of the prayer of faith, the anointing with all the call for the elders, the taking the medicine to complement the physical, if needed. Once we do everything we know to do to stand, to stand, and listen now, the results are up to God Almighty. We're off. It isn't my cross. My cross is to preach the gospel just like it is. Amen. Now it's over on the Lord. We cast all our cares over on Him, for He cares for our soul. Amen. Well, what if? It's in the hands of the Lord now. We've done our part. Yeah. Now the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. You never give up, but it's more about worship as it is the prayer. The prayer is already prayed. The prayer of faith, which involves the cross of Calvary every single time. Amen. So then what happens when the elders pray over the person is that we are to invoke the name of Jesus. That is the prayer of faith. So again, I ask, where do we pray for the sick? It's more about looking to God Himself and doing what He said to do then Leave the results in the hands of the Father God. Amen. I mean, the worst thing that happened when we just die and go to heaven. That's the worst thing that happened. Is that so bad? I mean, nobody wants to go, uh, you know. But then, do we have a choice? Well, we're believing for a long life, are we not? But then we may leave tonight. <laughs> and if. We do, I will say, catch a letter, alligator. <laughs> no, we joke about it, but you know, did you get the message? Yeah. Simple, to the point. Now, we've all been guilty in the past. 
Now, I'm not saying call for every little old ingrown toenail and the dog's having pups and, you know, and, but when it comes down to serious stuff, we need to get the church involved. We need to get the prayer chain going. And that intercessory prayer is very important. It's, mis it's, it, it's overlooked in the church. Back in the Pentecost day, the, the older ladies was in the back praying the fire down. Nobody saw them. Well, they could pray. Shake the hair down and all. They could pray. When we started church, man, the power would fall. Why? Because they, they were praying prayer warriors. Right. Prayer warriors. Then it's easier to receive because uh, God honors prayer. Let's stand up. Praise the Lord. Amen. So next time, God forbid, I have something go wrong with my physical body, spiritual, emotional, psychological, uh, social. Uh, somebody said something bad on Facebook? No. No, folks, the next time we have a problem, we are to believe God for the answer. Amen. We're to follow His protocol. And however it turns out, we've done our part. Right? Let's take it to heart tonight. What do you say, everybody? <laughs>